Lux presents Hollywood. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Dana Andrews and Ann Baxter in Where the Sidewalk Ends. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The immediate reaction of an innocent person involved in a crime is said to be one of panic, the desire to cover up or run away. Fortunately, most people resist this very human impulse and instead turn to their police departments, which have just as many ways and means of proving a man innocent as proving him guilty. But in tonight's play, Where the Sidewalk Ends, our innocent victim is a policeman. A policeman noted for his hatred of criminals, only to find himself wanted for murder. Starring in his original role, we have Dana Andrews, whose characterizations are always noted for their sincere artistry. And co-starring with him in this exciting 20th Century Fox drama is Ann Baxter another artist of undeniable talent and beauty. Well, the excitement of the Academy Awards is over. But I'm sure that you've been on hand to cheer the stars as they made their glamorous entrances into the theater, you wouldn't forget such a galaxy of Lux beauties for a long time. Hollywood stars are Lux lovely because their award for complexion care goes to Lux Toilet Soap. Here's where the sidewalk ends, starring Dana Andrews as Mark Dixon and Ann Baxter as Morgan Taylor. The night started off with a nice little surprise for me. Inspector Foley had stopped by. I was just going on duty when he called me aside. I want to talk to you, Dixon. We've had half a dozen more complaints against you for assault and battery. From who? Hoods, dusters, mugs, a lot of nickel rats. You're a big disappointment to me, Dixon. You've got to learn what's expected of a police detective and what isn't. Yes, sir. I'll try to learn not to hate hoods and thieves and gangsters too much. You don't hate him. You just like to beat him up. The tough cop who isn't afraid to wade in anywhere. Well, I'm reducing your rank. You're going back to detective second grade. Any more complaints and you'll be back in uniform. Yes, sir. It's no fun telling you this. You're a good man with a good brain. But you're no good to the department unless you learn to control yourself. That's all, Dix. I went out to the street. Detective Klein was waiting for me. Paul Klein, my partner. We'd be out now the rest of the night cruising around in a squad car. Just routine. Sorry for what happened, Mark. So he busted me. Relax. I live. Yeah, it's not like you were a married man with a wife and kids. Anyway, I'll bet you five bucks you... Hey, wait buy... a minute. Who's that at the corner? <laughs> what do you know? Our old pal, Willie Ben. Hey, Willie! How you feeling, Willie? Uh, me? I feel fine, thanks. Don't you think you'd better be in bed? Well, uh, the poor old boy allows me till 12 o'clock. I got, uh, I got 20 minutes yet. How's your boss, Willie? How's Mr. Scalisi? What are you trying to do, trap me? I, I ain't consorting with no questionable characters. That's a nice boy. Go to bed, Willie. It's good for you. Yeah, 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 sure. He's living at the 43rd Street Hotel. If you want to check up on him, we... Now, forget it. Let's believe him for once. <laughs> Some joke. Yeah. No, we didn't check Willie Bender. It's too bad. Oh, he went back to his hotel all right. But he went up to the eighth floor. A dice game was going on, and the host was a man named Tommy Scalise. I, I thought I'd better stop by, Tommy. I just bumped into Dixon and Klein. Did they give you any trouble? No, 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 no trouble. Uh, who, who's at the table? Somebody Payne picked up, a Mr. Morrison from Texas. He's very rich and getting richer. He's winning? Well, I'm not very happy about it. 
The girl uh, with Morse? No, she's with Payne. He brings them both here. Go on in and sit down. Oh, six is my lucky number, gentlemen. Yes, sir. I'll shoot the works. The whole 6,000. All right, are you taking any, gentlemen? I'll take two. All right, you're covered, Mr. Morrison. You know, I like your friends, Mr. Payne. I can't get any better action than this in Amarillo. All right, Dice. Now we're going for the big money. Well, what do you know? A seven. Looks like your friend wins again, Mr. Payne. I've heard about streaks like this, but I never... I'm beginning to think it's the little lady here. Miss Taylor, I thank you. Well, I hate to interfere with your good luck, Mr. Morrison. But if you don't mind, I'd like to go home. Nobody's going home. Ken, you know I have to be at work at 8.30. Well, that's right. You can't keep a working girl up all hours. Let's all go together. Mr. Morrison, you're 19 grand into us. Well, you'll get it back. I'm not leaving town for a week. Tell him you changed your mind. You want to stay. No, Ken. I told you I had to leave by midnight. You can't do this to me. I'm not doing anything to you. I brought him here. Oh, so that's it. Yes, that's it. And you're following me up again. That's all you ever do is follow me up. You're telling Morrison to stay. No, I'm not. I said you're telling him to stay. You asked for this pain. Stop it. Please. Stop it. The call came in over the radio. Homicide. 43rd Street Hotel, 8th floor. Half a dozen patrolmen were already there. His name's Morrison Payne, big barracuda. He was dead when we got here, knife wound. Nobody did it, nobody saw it. Morrison's got a cut on his knuckle. Looked like he hit somebody hard. Who runs this pawn aside? Tommy Scalisi. We got him in there in the bedroom, four or five other guys. Scalisi, that's nice, that's fine. I've been waiting for this for quite a while. Well, boys, kind of looks like old times, huh? Kramer, Bianchi, Marco. Hey... Look, Mark, Willie, Willie Bender. You should have gone to bed, Willie. You'd be asleep now. No parole problems. No, I, I, I live in this hotel. I, I just dropped in for a cigarette. And Mr. Scalise, where did you hide the knife, dream boy? Go easy, Dixon. Just keep your hands off me. Talk. You find a body and right away I'm a killer. You've been a killer for a long time. What are you always trying to push me into the gutter for? I've got as much right in the sidewalk as you have. Don't talk to me about rights. You're a pretty smart rat, Scalise, but this is your off night. Always jumping on me like I was something special. Getting you is a special job of mine. You know, I can't figure you out. Your father likes Shut me. Shut up. You got anything, Dixon? Huh? Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Oh, nothing yet, sir. No, I've been waiting to tell it to you, Lieutenant. Okay, let's have it. Now, Mr. Morrison was brought here by a fellow named Ken Payne, a sort of friend of mine. Payne was kind of drunk. There was a girl with him, I... Didn't quite get a name. Mr. Morrison wanted a little friendly play. How much did he win? He didn't win. He lost. You're lying, Scalise. Now, let's hear his story first, Dixon. Yeah, he lost a grand or so, but he didn't seem to care. He was making a play for this girl, see, and I guess Payne was jealous. Anyway, Payne hit the girl and she ran out. Then Morrison tackled Payne here in the bedroom. Well, before I could call the cops, Payne came out. He didn't say anything, just left. Then Morrison came out and fell on the floor. He was dead when I got to him. What did you do with the knife? I never saw a knife. Payne must have taken it alone. You're lying, Scalise. Let me handle him, Lieutenant. What's Payne's address? I don't know. He said, what's Payne's address? I... I don't remember. I... I guess I got it here in the book. Hand it over. All neat and ready with a fall guy, huh? Lieutenant, give me just ten minutes with him. Go after and Payne, Dixon. You and Klein, find pain. Come on, Paul, let's go. I went to Payne's place alone, so Klein could do some snooping around on his own. We'd save time. The address was a rundown apartment house. Next to the entrance were a few steps leading down to a basement apartment. I could see an old lady sitting there with a window knitting. Payne's apartment was on the ground floor. I was about to knock when I heard a voice inside. Let's call his room, will you? Morrison. Ted Morrison. Tell him Kenneth Payne is calling. Well, have him paged or something. Okay, hold on. Trying to get Morrison on the phone, huh? Who are you? 
Detective Dixon, 16th Squad. Get out. Maybe Morrison's trying to win his money back. Oh, don't give me that. He was cleaning up. How much? And he's got to cut me in. After what you did to him? Oh, he started it, coming up like that and slugging me. Oh, that piece of adhesive under your eye. Yeah, he must have hit you pretty hard. Ah, uh, why don't you just wise up? Hello? Well, leave a message then. Yeah, yeah, he knows where. Thanks. Now, get out. I don't like cops. Morrison isn't going to call you back, Payne. He's dead. Dead? You're lying. Scalise is trying to frame you. Says you knifed him. Ah, go home. Now, look. I'm trying to help you out. Scalise and his boys are hanging a murder on you. They knocked him off to get their money back. Now, come on. Now, get your hands off of me. Get out of here. Get out. Look, you swing at me again and I'll... You what? He didn't move. I thought at first he was faking. And I felt his pulse. But I knew before I touched his wrist, he was dead. Dead. And I'd killed him. And then suddenly the phone was ringing. Hello? Mark, this is Paul. Did you find pain? Can you hear me? I said, did you find pain? Mm. No, no, he isn't here. I picked up some stuff on him you should know. If you find him, go easy. He's a war hero. Got a hat full of medals and a lot of newspaper friends. I thought I'd better tip you off just in case he starts getting tough. You still been away from there? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'd better. I'll call you back later. Okay. This was it. End of the line. I couldn't control myself, the inspector said. And now I'd killed a man. It was an accident, a mistake, sure. But who would believe me? Who would believe me now? And then as I stood there, I saw the way out. The perfect way out. But I'd have to act fast. I dragged Payne's body into a closet. I found a suitcase, one of those heavy G.I. cloth bags... Payne's name was on it, stenciled in big letters. I went through his bureau, tossed his clothes in the bag. In the bathroom, I found a roll of adhesive tape, and I put a piece of it under my eye and phoned for a taxi cab. Then I put on Payne's coat and his hat and walked out. The old lady was still sitting by the window. I was careful, though, that she didn't see my face. I took the cab to Pennsylvania Station and bought a ticket for Pittsburgh. Then I checked Payne's hat, coat, and a bag in a locker, took off the adhesive, and went back to his apartment. It had all taken less than 30 minutes. But when I walked in, someone else was there, Paul Klein. I just got here, Mark. Where you been? Oh, covering a few of the bars in the neighborhood. No luck. Well, take a look around. Look at that bureau. Clothes gone, everything scattered around. Payne's been back, huh? Huh. Nice piece of luck for me, isn't it? Slipped in and out after I left here. You can't be everywhere. Let's have a look, though. I'd better see what's in that closet. Now, wait a minute. Maybe somebody saw him get away. There's an old lady downstairs. Yeah, I guess you're right. Let's see what she knows. Now, there's nothing to get alarmed about, madam. We just want to find out if you know Kenneth Payne. Yes, I know him. Have you seen him tonight? Yes, he left in the taxi maybe half an hour ago... I must have fallen asleep, and when the taxi comes, I woke up. I saw Mr. Payne go away. He had the suitcase. That's all we wanted to know, madam. Thank you very much. He's running for it, huh? Yeah, we'll get him. You cover the yellow cab stands around the neighborhood for the driver. I'll cover the independent garages and meet you back at the precinct. Oh, uh, I'd better keep the cruise car. Yeah, sure. See you later, Mark. <laughs> around for a few minutes, and then I came back to Payne's apartment. The old lady downstairs had pulled the shade and turned out her light. All I needed was a minute, 60 seconds to get Payne's body out to the car. I got as far as the hallway when I heard a car door slam. Someone was coming in from the street. I barely had time to hide behind the stairway. All right, Payne. Open up. I know you're in there, so open up. Now look, you dirty rat. Open up or I'll... He opened the door and went in. But in no time at all, he was on his way out again, muttering to himself. I carried Payne's body out to the car. I knew what to do with it. 
Forty minutes later, I was back in the squad room of the 16th precinct. We're starting to get a few breaks, Mark. We got his hat, coat, and his suitcase. Uh, Benson went down to Penn Station. One of the porters said he saw Payne's ticket in the locker. Anything else? Yeah, I got the cab driver. Signed statement. He picked Payne up at the apartment about 110. How could he be sure it was Payne? The guy had a piece of adhesive under his left eye. Not only that, the driver said his name was on the suitcase. Benson just got hold of something else. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Ticket agent at Penn Station remembers selling Payne a ticket to Pittsburgh. It's pretty clear he's trying to throw us off, sir. Ten to one, he's holed up right here in town somewhere. Any line on the bill yet, Benson? Nothing yet, sir. I'm still calling. Well, see that Payne's description is teletyped to Pittsburgh just in case. I'm going home for a couple of hours. Klein, you and Dixon knock off. Report back at eight. I'll call if anything breaks. Yes, sir. You look beat, Mark. Don't you feel good? I'll see you in the morning. So the inspector busted you to second grade. Don't let it eat you, Mark. Go on, get some sleep. The worst was over. Sure, they'd find Payne's body sooner or later. Well, let them find her. That body could put put Scalisi where he belonged. The death house in Sing Sing. It wasn't until the next afternoon that we ran down the girl. Her name was Morgan Taylor, a model for a dress manufacturer on 8th Avenue. Sit down, Miss Taylor, won't you? Your boss said we could use his office here. Were you with Kenneth Payne last night? Yes. Have you been in touch with him today? No. No, I haven't. From what we heard, miss, you're pretty well acquainted with Payne. Yes. How well? Could you tell us, please? I'm his wife. But you're living with your father up in Washington Heights. Ken and I separated some months ago. Well, what happened at Scalise's hotel suite last night? May I ask why you're asking me all these questions? We'd rather tell you afterward, if you don't mind. Well, Ken was drinking and we had a quarrel. I understand he hit you. Yes. Did you see him hit Morrison? They started to fight. I left right away. And where did you go? Home. Take a taxi? No, I met my father at his stand, a block from the hotel. He's a taxi driver. He drove me to the subway. Did you hear from Payne after you got home? Yes. He telephoned, but I hung up. What time was that? About uh, 12.30, I imagine. Did he phone from his house? No. Well, how would you know if you hung up? Because my father went over to Ken's place after he dropped me. Ken wasn't there. What did he go there for? Really, is this necessary? We think it is, Miss Taylor. Well, I... I wasn't going to tell my father anything, but... I was crying and he noticed the bruise. What did he say? He was very angry. He told me before that if Ken... Well? That if Ken ever hit me again, he'd show him what a real beating was like. Miss Taylor, Morrison was killed last night. He... he what? At Scalise's place, shortly after you left. And you're looking for Ken because you think he did it? When did your husband start getting jealous of Mr. Morrison? Jealous? Oh, but that's silly. I hardly knew Mr. Morrison. But you went out with him? No, 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 I didn't. Ken called me up and asked me out to dinner. You just said you were separated. Yes, but he kept insisting, and I... Well, I felt sorry for him. And after I met him, Mr. Morrison was with him. After dinner, Ken took us to the gambling place, and... Then I realized that all he wanted me for was to use me as a sort of decoy to help get Mr. Morrison there. It was sinking pretty low, I thought. Poor Ken. He must be desperate for money. Why did he hit you? Because I wanted to go home. But he didn't want Mr. Morrison to leave. Why not? Because he'd won a great deal of money. I think they said about $19,000. Thank you for the information, miss. We won't bother you any longer. We turned our report in to Lieutenant Thomas. But I couldn't get the girl out of my mind. I'd have to see her again. There were things I had to find out. At six o'clock, I was back on 8th Avenue waiting for Morgan Taylor. Now, Mr. William Keeley, our producer. Act two of Where the Sub- Sidewalk Ends, starring Dana Andrews as Mark 
and Ann Baxter as Morgan. I waited for Morgan Taylor in the lobby of the building with no more idea of how all this was going to end than the people milling about me. Morrison was dead, murdered. And as sure as I was standing here, Scalise had killed him. But Kenneth Payne was also dead. Two of a kind, Scalise and I. Well, we'll be on time. Don't worry about it. Oh, hello, Mr. Dixon. Well, did you find Ken? No, not yet, Miss Taylor. But you think I know where he's hiding, is that it? Where are you going now? I'm going home. Do you mind if I come along? That's a nice way of putting it when you're out to give me the third degree. No, this is no third degree. This is strictly off the record. Are you having dinner with anyone? Are you inviting me? Yes. Well, if you don't mind my going home first. This way, Mr. Dixon, we'll take the sub. So she took me to her home. Her father was there. The man who had come to Payne's apartment the night before. He was a nice guy, but full of questions. Well, what do the police think, Mr. Dixon? I mean, any other suspects besides Ken? What about the gangster, that, that Scalise fellow? Well, the department thinks he's clean on that job. He's been released on bail, on a gambling charge only. But uh, you got your own ideas, huh? Well, he lied about Morrison being a loser. Your daughter says Morrison was about 19000 ahead. Ask if he's got a record as long as your arm. Ain't the first time he's been mixed up in a murder. All the same, I wouldn't tell people about going to Payne's place to beat him up. I don't I care who knows about it. He had it coming for a long time. But when he and Morgan... Dad, please. Mr. Dixon isn't interested in my life story. Well, I'd like to know what Mr. Dixon would do if he had a son-in-law like that. Well, I guess I'm ready, Mark. Good night, darling. Nice meeting you, Mr. Taylor. Yeah, sure. Good night, honey. Have fun. I took her to a place called Martha's Cafe. She was deserving of something a little higher class, but I knew if Paul Klein wanted to find me, he'd be likely to try the cafe. Well, Mr. Detective, where you've been hanging out? Hello, Martha. This is Miss Taylor. Good evening. How do you do? You know, I like places like this that specialize in good food instead of head waiters. It's the worst food in town, isn't it, Martha? Yeah, <laughs> well, who asked you to come in? Not me. <laughs> Martha's the head of a ring of burglars. My presence makes her nervous. Well, bring us two of your dangerous dinners, Martha. You want wine? Bring us a small bottle. Yes, yeah, sure. The same old cheapskate. <laughs> well, I hope you come here often, young lady. For five years, this man sits in my restaurant, frightening everybody away. <laughs> now, with a beautiful lady, he looks almost human. <laughs> She's very fond of you, isn't she? She ought to be. I sent her husband up. Was he really a burglar? <laughs> Wife beater. <laughs> Tell me something. Have you been trying to get in touch with Payne? No. I don't know quite what to do. When did you marry him? After the war. But we knew each other before that. You said this morning you were separated. May I ask why? Oh, it's hard to say why you leave a man or why you stop loving him. I always blame Ken, but I guess it was my fault, too. Not understanding what made him seem so mean and impossible. I guess that the chief thing wrong with Ken was no job and lots of pride. Too much pride. A man can usually find work if he wants to. You're worried about me feeling badly because he's going to be arrested, aren't you? Something like that. I think I'll stick by him if he is. I owe it to him. You still love him, huh? No. No, it isn't love anymore. Mr. Detective, telephone! Excuse me. That must be my partner. He probably wants to know what I'm eating. I'll be right back. Hello? Mark, this is Paul. We're trying to get you for an hour. Big doings. We found pain. Where? A watchman down at the docks reported that somebody slugged him about 3 o'clock this morning. Benson and Schmidt went down to talk to him, but nothing made sense. Nothing stolen, nothing missing. So the watchman remembered that man held something like a body. Well, we started dragging the river. It's pain, all right. Well, how could they tell us? Hang on, Mark. Lieutenant Thomas wants to talk to you. 
This Thomas. We're meeting in Payne's apartment in 15 minutes. Be there. Okay, Lieutenant. What's the matter, Mr. Detective? <laughs> you look sick. Give me the check, Martha. You gotta leave the beautiful girl just when she's beginning to like you. Serves you right for being a detective. Something happened, Mark? Yeah, I've got to leave right away. Oh, please, go ahead and finish your dinner. It's really very nice. That's the best chicken and rice in town. I'll, uh, I'll call you just as soon as I can. I'm so sorry, Mark. Good night. You like him, huh? I think he's very nice. You know what that fella needs? Uh-uh. A family. He's got nobody. All he thinks of day and night is his job. A fellow like him ought to be married to a beautiful girl, have a home and kids. Ah, oh, you're wasting your propaganda, Martha. I'm married. Buzzing a married woman? Just wait till I see that door. <laughs> when I reached Payne's apartment, they were all in the hallway. Thomas, the medical examiner, Klein, half a dozen other detectives... <laughs> They discovered something in back of the stairway. A blood stain. Well, boys, that clinches it. Payne was killed there in his room. Somebody came in and slugged him. He fell to the floor. He had a silver plate in his head, the result of a shrapnel wound in the war. The fall must have killed him. Yeah, it all adds up, Lieutenant. The killer was trying to get the body out when someone opened the front door. That was probably you, Dixon. Yes, sir. So he ducked behind these stairs with the body. That accounts for the blood stain on the wall. It also establishes the time of the killing is between 12.30, when Payne must have got here, and 3 a.m. when the killer knocked out that watchman at the dock. But there's... there's just one thing I don't understand. Dixon, I just don't understand why you didn't see him. You were here at 12.50. Klein spoke with you on the phone. Oh, that's right. Well, Payne left here at 1.10. That's when the taxi picked him up. You must have practically passed each other. Well, he wasn't here, so I had a look in a couple of bars. The guy on the lamb is going to be sitting around bars? What time did Dixon get back here, Klein? About 1.50, sir. And you left right after that? That's right. We started chasing Payne. But he lays a fake trail. He goes to Penn Station and then straight back to this apartment. The police have been here, he figures. They won't come looking again. Say, say, what time did Jiggs Taylor say he was here? About 2.15, sir. That pretty well puts the finger on him, Lieutenant. Yeah, he was crazy angry, according to his daughter, ready to knock Payne's block off. Hey, you're wasting your time on Taylor. Scalise did this. You're way off base, Dixon. I'm telling you, Scalise knifed Morrison, then he was afraid Payne would talk. So he sent someone after him to finish him off. That doesn't stand up at all. Whoever killed Payne killed him by accident. No Scalise hood would have taken a chance on a fist fight. He'd have knifed Payne or shot him. Hey, excuse me, Lieutenant. We got Jiggs Taylor and his daughter outside. Bring them in. Well, boys, I think we can wrap the case up tonight with statements from both of them. I'm Lieutenant Thomas, Miss Taylor. How do you do? Evening, Lieutenant. Well, I was expecting this as I told the boys on the way down. Daughter phoned the house just as we got there, Lieutenant. We asked her to meet us here. Well, the minute they told me Ken was murdered, I knew I was in for going over. Well, I was here, all right. Well, go on. Let's have the rest of it. Well, that's all there was. The door was unlocked. I walked in, looked around, nobody home, so I walked out. With his body. You took the body to the river, knocked out the watchman, and dropped pain in the water. Oh, so I knocked out a watchman, too, huh? That's fine. Now, let me tell you something. I didn't see pain. If I had seen him, I'd have taken a poke at him. I ain't denying that. But I left this place a minute after I got here. And I picked up a fare on the corner, Congressman Reynolds. Took him to the Astor Hotel. And what time do you claim you got to the Astor Hotel? About 2.40. Excuse me, Lieutenant. Well, Dixon, the watchman was slugged at 3 a.m. That gives Mr. Taylor 20 minutes between 2.40 and 3 o'clock to come back here from the Astor Hotel, kill Payne, lug the body out to his cab, drive down to the pier, and slug the watchman. He couldn't have done it, sir, not in 20 minutes. He could be wrong, Lieutenant, especially if the congressman backs up his story. But we're not wrong. All right, so he picked up Congressman Reynolds. But all the while, Taylor had Payne's body in the back trunk of the cab. Oh, that, that's crazy. He leaves the Astor Hotel, drives to the pier, slugs the watchman, and drops Payne's body. Twenty minutes was plenty of time. Payne was out of here at 110, according to the old lady downstairs. We're just wasting time. Well, I don't happen to think we are. As for the old lady, we're going down there right now and talk to her. Come along, Taylor. <laughs> Many 
many foolish questions. I tell you again, I saw Mr. Payne last night. Well, I, I'd like to try a little experiment, Miss Strybaum. This is Payne's coat and hat, Taylor. I want you to put them on. Oh, now, wait a second. What for? Sure, you were here last night at 210, but that was your second visit. The first time you walked out with his hat, his coat, and his bag after you'd killed him and stuck his body away somewhere. But I, I told you the truth. Then put the coat on. No, don't do it, Dad. They have no right to ask you to do that. What are you trying to prove? That Mrs. Trybaum here did not see pain last night. That all she actually saw was a hat, a coat, and a bag. But his face. Mr. Payne, he had a piece of adhesive tape on his face. So what? Dixon, get some adhesive tape. Put a strip under your left eye and then take this hat and coat and walk out to the street. That's comic strip stuff, Lieutenant. If Mrs. Traubon says she saw Payne, wait, how can we... Wait, Well? Last night, Mr. Payne, he did not wave at me. Did Mr. Payne always wave at you? Always. It was not Mr. Payne, no. He would have waved. Well, that's it, boys. Take Taylor and book him. Why, you're kidding. Am I? Take him along, boys. Please. I'd like to talk to my father. Alone. Sorry, miss. He's under arrest. Dad, please. Did you see Ken last night? So help me, honey. I swear by your ma. Never saw him or laid a hand on him. I believe you, darling. Don't worry. Please don't worry. In a moment, they'd all left. Just Klein and me standing there on the sidewalk. Well, we got a hand at the Thomas, huh? He sure wrapped this one up quick. Mm, stop talking like an idiot. He bungled it. Oh, now, wait a minute. That's not fair. Don't tell me what's fair. I know Scalise did it. Scalise did both jobs, Morrison and Payne. You can't go against the facts, Mark. I'll bet Taylor admits everything. Hey, where are you going? I'm going to find Scalise and get it out of him. Now, wait a minute, Mark. You know the boss's orders. Let go of me. Look, I'm giving it to you straight, like a friend. I don't like to see you made a monkey out by a girl with a pretty face. You've got a record to protect. You're as dumb as Thomas. Come on, get in. I'll drive you home. You're driving me nowhere, you dumb lug. Now, let go of me or I'll paste you. Okay, Mark. Okay. I guess you know what you're doing. I found Scalise sooner than I expected A Turkish bath He was in the rubbing room getting a massage A few of his friends followed me in I tell him we're closed for the night, Mr. Scalise So he gives me a shove and walks right in Well, it must be important, uh, Mr. Dixon Get dressed, Scalise When I'm ready, Mr. Dixon I said get dressed <laughs> Now, wait a minute I'll give you one warning just don't touch me again. Why not? You don't have a knife now, do you, Scalise? We found the one you used on Morris. <laughs> That's a laugh. Is it? It's always a pleasure to watch a cop four flushing. <laughs> Maybe now you know I'm not kidding. Morrison had you for almost 20 grand. He wanted to leave, so you knifed him. Then you got worried about pain, so you sent one of your mugs down to knock him off. You trying to frame me for pain? You killed Morrison and you killed Payne. And I'm going to get a statement out of you. Right outside, you guys, he's going to talk and talk to me alone. I said outside. It's crazy. What are we going to do with a crazy man? All right, boys, take care of Mr. Dixon. Hey, hold him. Hold him. Give him. Give him. I'd known what my chances were when I went looking for Scalise. I got just about what I'd asked for. I was still half-dazed when I found myself uptown, knocking on the door of Morgan Taylor's apartment. Mark! If you don't mind, I, I'd like to talk to you. You're, you're hurt. What happened? I could use a drink. Sit down. Where the devil am I? I keep coming and going. I don't know why I came here. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll go. You can't leave like this. Here, drink it. Thanks. Why did I come here? I must have had something on my mind. What happened? Uh, 
A run-in with Scalisi and his pals. Well, shouldn't I call the, the police? No, no, no. Leave the police out of this. I made a big idiot out of myself tonight. Bigger than usual. Did I bungle this one? Come with me. I'll try to fix your head. I suggest you use an axe. Why did you fight with Scalisi, Mark? Did it have anything to do with my dad? In a way, yes. You don't think Dad did it? Do well, what, what I think doesn't matter a row of nickels. The important thing is that you need a lawyer. Yeah, I guess that's what I came here for. You need a big-time lawyer. Here, hold this bottle. One that can't lose. But if Dad's innocent, I don't see innocent why Innocent he... people can get into terrible jams, too. There's one false move, and you're in over your head. How much money you got, you and your father, for a lawyer? <laughs> None. No savings? Very little. Hmm. Payne got that, too, huh? Yes. Now, hold still. Oh, Mark, you look just awful. I feel just fine. Well, thanks for the facial. Now what? Well, I'll get out of here. I'll, I'll phone you in the morning. And you wait here until I do. Don't go out. Wait till I phone. You're not fooling me, Mark. You do believe Dad didn't kill him. Your father never touched him. Then, then you know something. I know plenty. Good night, Morgan. Curtain rises on Act Three of Where the Sidewalk Ends, starring Dana Andrews as Mark and Ann Baxter as Morgan. It would take a thousand dollars to retain the kind of lawyer Jiggs Taylor was going to need. I got the money out of the bank and phoned Morgan. We met at Martha's Cafe for a cup of coffee. Why are you doing this for me, Mark? I, I never heard of anything so generous. Forget it. Well, I've left the money with Ackerman. He's a great lawyer. He'll see you later this afternoon around 5.30. Did anyone ever tell you you're a very unusual person? <laughs> I doubt if your boss would agree. Or doesn't he care if you run out like this? <laughs> I didn't tell you, did I? He fired me. I'm the notorious Morgan Taylor. Bad for buyers. I take their minds off the dresses. Sorry to bust in, Mr. Detective. Uh, there's a phone call for you. Well, you want to answer it? No, I'm busy, Mother. Oh, it's wonderful the way he looks at you, Miss Taylor. He hasn't even touched his coffee. <laughs> he just drinks you up like with his eyes because you're so beautiful. Oh, cut it up. What's the matter? I'm trying to help you. You don't even know how to talk to a girl. Look, if somebody's waiting on that phone, you'd better get out. Mr. Klein, Mr. Klein, somebody named Inspector Foley is looking for you. Well, um, I'll tell him you're not here. Thanks. I I guess I'd better check in, Morgan. I I may be a little while. If I were you, I'd go right over to Ackerman's office now. It may even be better if you see him alone. Then wait for me at my hotel. That's uh, 230A East 54th. Whatever you say, Mark. And thanks. Thanks for everything. You wanted to see me, Inspector? Well, you're a fine-looking sight. Who beat you up? Oh, it was just a personal affair, sir. Scalisi and his friends, huh? We know all about it, Dixon. Klein picked up one of Scalise's men, Steve Marco. We're going to hold him for a while. Yes, sir. The lieutenant here says you had orders to let Scalise alone. Well, I thought I could get a statement out of him. Well, you didn't, did you? And now your bullheaded tactics have driven him to cover. It'll take us days to find him. I'll find him. You'll find nobody. 
I'm not throwing you out of the department like I should, but I'm inviting you to take one week of your annual vacation beginning as of right now. I don't want to see or hear of you for a week. Yes, sir. That's all, Dixon. Get out. And he's got a point, Thomas. You shouldn't have let Scalise go, even on bail, until the Morrison job was cleaned up. Well, it uh, looks so certain that Payne had done it. And get to work on that hoodlum Klein brought in. Steve Marco, huh? I've got a hunch he'll talk if you keep at him. And try talking to him like Dixon would. Yes, sir. I went back to my hotel and waited for Morgan. It was easy to see that something had happened. She had been crying. Here. This is yours, Mark. What is it? Your thousand dollars. Mr. Ackerman won't take the case. Oh. Well, there are other lawyers. Just as good as Ackerman, too. It won't help. Well, look, it's no different than it was. You felt all right before. Maybe I just didn't realize how serious it is. I thought because Dad's innocent, nothing can happen to him. But it will. It won't. It's already happened. He's in jail. They'll try him, and he, he didn't do anything. Somebody else did it, and he's got to pay for it. He won't be tried. Don't try to fool me, Mark. Ackerman didn't take the case because he was afraid of losing it. I'm not fooling you. Nothing's going to happen to your father. Why? How can you be so sure? Because he didn't kill Payne. And you can prove he didn't. Yes. You do know something you haven't told me. That's right. Well, what is it? Oh, please. It's, it's not fair to stand there and not tell me. Even if you have to break some police rule. If you know something, Mark, I can't stand thinking how he feels. He's never done anything wrong. You don't know him. He's sweet. He's, he's kind. He's always felt that everybody was his friend. Now he's in prison like a criminal. You don't know what it is to have your father in trouble. My father was a thief. He's dead now. He died when I was 17, trying to shoot his way out of jail. I've worked all my life to be different from him. Oh, Mark. Darling, I didn't know. You'd better go home, Morgan. Why? Because you're... You're a sucker for wrong guys. Like Ken and me. You're not wrong. I trust you, Mark. And I'm glad you told me about your father. You're not like him, I know it. Thanks. Anyway, I've figured out what to do. Just don't ask questions. You're leaving? Now? Yeah, I'll be back. Why don't you lie down? Try to get some sleep. You're worn out. But I'm not afraid anymore. Everything's going to be all right, isn't it, Mark? Sure. Everything's going to be fine. I'll wait for you, Mark. Yes, I've figured out what to do. I'd have to find Scalisi. I'd have to find him right away. So I went looking for Willie Bender, the two-bit hood, still out on parole. Well, I, I wasn't doing nothing, Mr. Dixon. Just standing here reading my paper. Lay off for me, will you? I'm not interested in what you were doing, Willie. You're up for parole violation on Monday. Three more years, isn't it? Well, there's nothing you can do, Mr. Dixon. Well, I can say I sent you up to Scalise's hotel using you for a stoolie. You're trying to get me to talk about the Morrison job? No, something a lot easier than that, Willie. Just tell me where I can find Scalise. Now. Tonight. You're going to tell me, Willie. You'll save yourself three years and a lot of trouble. Bad trouble. What do you call this? Good trouble? You're asking for it. And now you're going to get it. No, wait, 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 wait. Look, they'll kill me, Mr. Dixon. Where's Scalise? I don't know. Maybe, maybe I can find out a... Telephone. Let me get to a telephone. Come on. There's a drugstore at the corner. Hey, here's a nickel, Willie. I, I couldn't reach Scalise. Who were you talking to? Kramer. It was Kramer. He says he'll contact Scalise in an hour. Yeah, that's more like it. He says you should be in the East River Drive across the street from the hospital at 10 o'clock. If everything's okay, he'll pick you up there. But you, you got to come along. Thanks. Hey, what about my parole? I've done everything I could. Let's see what happens first, Willie. Just in case you've been lying to me. Back at the hotel, I asked the clerk to call a messenger. 
I was going to write a letter, and I wanted it delivered quickly. I went to my room. Morgan was asleep on the sofa. I sat down at my desk and wrote the letter. I addressed the envelope to Inspector Foley to be opened in case of my death. And I walked over to the sofa. Morgan. There was so much I wanted to say to her. But nothing I could say. At 10 o'clock, Kramer was waiting for me on the East River Drive. Come on, Dixon. Get in the car. Wait a minute. Who's with you? A couple of friends. Scalisi? No, but he's willing to see under certain conditions. What conditions? You gotta park your gun. Okay, here. What else? I gotta frisk you. Well, do it in the car. We're wasting time. It's all right with me, Mr. Dixon. Let's go. We drove for about 20 minutes, and we stopped at a garage, a big garage, four stories high with elevators for parking cars on different levels. Another of Mr. Scalisi's enterprises. On the top floor, in an office, he was waiting for The boys here didn't believe me, Mr. Dixon. Yes, right. They said you'd never come alone. Hey, sit down. You see, I was right, boys. I understand, Mr. Dixon. I said sit down. I heard you, Scalisi. I never saw a man so full of hate. I'm in the clear on the Morrison job. The police are satisfied to let me alone, but you're still on my neck as always. It don't add up, Dixon. You're through talking? Maybe you thought you could stop me running by coming after me, eh? Now, we're not running. We're all fixed to leave tomorrow morning. Passports in order and everything. As soon as they spring Steve Marco. Well, you came here for something, so let's see what it is. Only... First, I'm giving you a little advice. You start mussing me up and you're going to get it, and this time for keeps. You throw one punch and they let you have it. So just stand back, Mr. Dixon, before you... All right, all right. No more shooting. You sure ask for it, Tommy. Shut up, shut up. Take a look at him. Well, how bad is it? His arm... How do you like that? Ten feet, Kramer, and the best you can do is... Wait a minute. Now I know. Now I know what it's all about. I told you this Dixon's crazy. Sure, he asked for it. That's what he came here for, so we should rub him out. Get your stuff, Kramer. Fix his arm. Now that's a great way to frame somebody. Get yourself knocked off. Guy's got to be out of his head for that. I didn't know a guy could hate that much. No, Dixon, not even you. You got it all figured out, huh, Scalise? And all because your old man set me up in business. <laughs> yeah, I should have known it the minute you tried to hang the paint job on. Yeah. You were the first cop to get to Payne's apartment. You found Payne, you slugged him, you killed him. And you've been walking around ever since. Half cop, half killer, the man who hates crooks. The law that works by itself. The cop who can't stand to see a killer loose. So what are you? A hood and a mobster just like your old man. Answer that telephone, somebody. Hello? Who? Well, go ahead. Hold Tom. that arm still, will you, Dixon? You know, I, you and me ought to get more friendly now, Dixon. There are lots of things a smart cop could do for me. Did now, Bianchi, you might have... They made Steve talk. What? Bianchi says he let go of the whole works about Morris. Oh, come on. We can't stay here. I haven't finished the bandage. Ah, let him bleed. Come on. Where's the car? Out there on the floor. Now, to get the elevator. Get the car into the elevator. The door locked behind them as they ran out. There was a flight of stairs that led up to the roof. Far off, I could hear the sirens. Yes, our pal Steve must have told plenty. But then I heard something else. The whir of machinery. The motors that ran the elevators. The shed was right here on the roof. I kicked in the door and pulled every switch I could find. And then I waited for the squad cars. Come in, Dixon. Come on in. Well, what's the doctor say? Well, says that I'll have to learn to eat with my left hand for a while, sir. It's just flesh. Morgan. Mark. Mark, are you sure you're all right? 
What are you doing here? They're letting my father go, Mark. I don't know what to say, but thank you. You can't change, can you, Dixon? Always breaking orders. Always doing things your own way. Well, you know we got Scalisi? Yes, sir. Lieutenant Thomas told me. He's confessed to the Morrison murder. I think he's ready to talk about the pain killing, too. This time I gotta hand it to you. Thanks, Inspector. Well, I'm putting you back where you were, recommending you for promotion. Oh, and here. Here's your letter back. Since there was no report of your death, I didn't open it. You expected to die? I don't think he knows what he expected, Miss Taylor. He was pretty sore at me when he wrote this. I think he's in a different mood now. Dad's waiting, Mark. Will you come home with us? Go on. Take a rest till that arm heals. I'd like you to open the letter, Inspector. Now. You sure? Yes, sir. I'm sure. Mark, what is it? Read it, Inspector. Out loud. Hmm. I uh, didn't have the courage to tell you this while I was alive because I didn't want to end up like Sandy Dixon's kid. That's what every hood in New York calls me, Sandy Dixon's kid. I wanted to end up as a cop, and that's what I'm going to do. I... I killed Kenneth Payne. It was an accident. I went in to arrest him. He slugged me, and I hit back. How was I to know he had a silver plate in his head? It's true that Morrison had hit him, too, just before Morrison was knifed. Maybe that blow had something to do with it, maybe not. But the fact remains that Payne is dead. And I covered it up like a mobster because I couldn't shake loose from what I was. Now I'm shaken loose. I'm going to get Scalisi for you. He's a hood like my old man was. You don't have to worry about putting the Morrison killing on him. You can pull him in for mine. And maybe that'll square things all around. Signed, Mark Dixon. And I guess that clears up both cases. You're under arrest. Mark. Report to Lieutenant Thomas. I'll name the charge myself. Yes, sir. Goodbye, Morgan. No, Mark, no. They'll believe you. They must believe you. It was an accident, a mistake. Anybody can make a mistake. You mean you'll give Sandy Dixon's kid another chance? Every chance in the world. That's enough to live for. So long, Morgan. So long, darling. Inspector, please. It's wrong to arrest him. You don't have to. Please. I have to. Just the same as he had to. But he's got a chance, Miss Taylor. You and I are going to make a pretty good pair of witnesses for him. He's got a fine chance. Thank you, Inspector. Now, here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. And here they are, coming forward for a well-earned curtain call. Dana Andrews and Ann Baxter. Well, Dana, have you been cruising in your catch lately, fishing again at Ensenada, Mexico? (laughs) No, Bill, I've been in the water and under it, but not on it. You mean you're learning to swim or something? No, Anne, you see, I've been on location in the Virgin Islands where Richard Widmark and I were making the frogmen. The frogmen? Don't believe I know any. (laughs) (laughs) No, Anne, they've been kept pretty secret. It's a slang term for the underwater demolition teams which played such an heroic part preparing beaches for landings for our boys during the last war. And believe me, they certainly have all my admiration and respect. In the eight weeks we were on location, we were in or under the water about 90% of the time. We were just one step aside of sharks and pneumonia. And this was only acting, but it was pretty rough. That's because you're always making pictures about some branch of our armed forces, Dana. You know what those fellows go through. Personally, I'll just follow the sun. You mean you let the sun shine on a beautiful complexion like yours? Oh, don't worry, Bill. I take the very best care of my complexion. That's why I'm a Lux girl. But I was talking about my new picture at 20th Century Fox. 
follow the sun. Oh, that's where Glenn Ford plays the part of Ben Hogan, the famous golfer, isn't That's it? right. And I'm Mrs. Hogan. Whether you know anything about golf or not, Ben Hogan's wonderful comeback should serve as an inspiration to everyone. Yes, I think it proves the individual is every bit as important as a team. At least he is in this country. And what are you presenting here next week, Bill? An individual or a team of stars? Next week, we'll have another exciting story of suspense and intrigue. It's the David O. Selznick production with a very famous theme music, The Third Man. As our stars from the original cast, we'll have Joseph Cotton. And as his co-star, a fine actress, Evelyn Keyes. You won't want to miss this thrilling manhunt through Europe for a murderer. We'll be listening, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night and all our thanks. The KNX Drama Hour on KNX 1070 News Radio. Dana Andrews appeared by arrangement with Samuel Goldwyn. Heard in our cast tonight were Bill Boucher as Scalise, Kay LaBelle as Martha, and Leo Cleary as Jake. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. <laughs>